Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. I'm joined today with uh, an honored guest, Dr. Juan Carlos Rodriguez Oliveri, who is the Director of Early Onset Scoliosis at NYU Langone Health. Welcome, Dr. Oliveri. Thank you for the invitation today. Now, I wanted to go back um, just a couple of years to when you were 12, and uh, you were diagnosed with scoliosis at, at that point. Obviously, that was a, a life-changing event for you. Can you fill us into the specifics at that time? Yeah, so um, my father sold me a, a hump in the back. He's a neurologist, so he took me to the orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he asked for an x-ray, and I got a 28-degree uh, thoracolumbar curve. Um, I was research zero, Sanders one. So the first thing they say, okay, you need a brace. And I remember completely because I said to my father, no way I'm going to do a brace. Uh, I was living in Puerto Rico for, by that time, you know, so the weather is hot all the time. Mm. Uh, and you know how kids are in school. I knew that I had to be with a brace every day. They're going to start be laughing. And I, so I said, no way, I'm not going to do that. So my father said, well, you're going to have to do something for it. And I go, tell me what you want. So they said, let's start swimming. So we start swimming. And I was lucky because genetically, as you know, uh, my genes were not to, uh, to get into the surgical point, And I'm still half 28 degrees. So I was lucky. Uh, it's not because swimming stopped it. It's because uh, my genes stopped it. But uh, it was a very bad experience because, you know, 12 year old kid who wants to be with a t shirt and running around and they tell you you're going to use the brace until you're 18 years old. Uh, it was a big, a big hit. Um, so I always remember like something like, you know, you look backwards and I go, points in your life that you remember, that was one. Absolutely. So you were a very poor compliant patient. And I, 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 no poor compliance. I didn't get it. So it was not even that we didn't have a chance to do that. <laughs> so I told my father, not even buy it because I was not going to use it, you know, so. Okay. Now, since your father was a neurologist, did you have an inkling fairly early on that you wanted to get into medicine? Not really. I um, basically, I decided to go to medical world when I uh, went to university. Uh, because of my back problems, I always been, you know, behind my, you know, I was thinking, how can I resolve this in a way that people don't need to get braces? I was not thinking about surgery, only braces. Okay. Because out of 100 scoliosis, uh, you know, surgery is less than 10% and braces are 50. So, and so we, you know, I started studying a little bit about it and I said, you know, I want to go to medical school. And, you know, my father was a neurologist, so that's a, a point that, you know, he was trying to get me into medical school too, so. Tried to encourage you, I guess. Yeah, he did. Now, um, so you went to medical school in Spain, correct? And yeah. After that, uh, did you have to take a, I assume you had to take a, some sort of specialty in orthopedics. And did you mm -hmm. come, go back to the U.S. for that? Or where was your journey? So um, it was a long journey. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I went to medical school in Spain basically because in Spain you don't do four years of uh, pre-med pre and then you go to medical school. The, in Europe you go like a six years, like in Brown University that you go six years. They have that type of program. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is my mother is from Spain. I was born in Spain. And then I was there until three years old. And then we went back to Puerto Rico. And I was 18 years, I wanted to, you know, I want to see my parents there. I, I want to experience the part of, uh, of myself that I didn't uh, get when I went back to Puerto Rico. So I decided to, to go back to Spain. Okay. And I love it so much, I didn't want to go back to Puerto Rico, so. Okay. Yeah. Now in terms I, of- I did, yeah, so I did medical school there, and then uh, in Spain you had to do an exam to get into a residency. Uh, it's, it's, so they 
they rank you, and if you get number 10, nine people in front of you choose a uh, specialty and the hospital. So there's no interview. So you get, uh, to get into uh, orthopedics, you need to be uh, below 500 out of uh, 30,000 people that take the test. Okay. Because, you know, and, and even that, even you have a, maybe you are number one, number two, and the number one take, can take your residency and your hospital. So it's very competitive in a way that there is no subjective. It's always subjective. You have a number, you get in or you don't get in. Mm. That's the way. Okay. And then when I finish, when my fourth year orthopedic residency, I want to, um, be a spine surgeon, so I came to NY, uh, HSS first and then NYU to do my fellowship. You know, like you talked about at the beginning, sometimes there are these events that shape your pathway and having scoliosis was one of yours and then eventually becoming a spine surgeon. Um, with What was your first exposure to um, spine surgery in terms of tethering? Were you exposed to VBS at the beginning, or was it straight into VBT, or was it just with ASC? No, so basically, I started this journey, uh, I think it was 2005, 2006, around that, 2007. I was doing at least 60, 78 idiopathic scolies a year, and we changed from thoracic anterior fusions to all pedicle screws in the thoracic spine. So, you know, I, and I was doing cases, cases. The first years I was very happy because the correction we got was much better than with the old technology. But I, you know, I was thinking, why I put 30 screws into this girl who is completely normal and the only thing she had is a deformity. So by that time, people like John Brown and in Boston and Randy Betts were, you know, trying to look for, um, a way to help with the growing and at the same time not to do a big fusions. And uh, I was working in Maimonides there, Dr. Francois was also doing tethers in, in big animals. You know, if you take, you go back from 2.5 to 2.10, there was a lot of uh, animal studies about tethers. So, you know, I was following that closely, but there were no system mm -hmm. like specified specifically for, um, tethers or ISC and people were using the Seamer Biomed uh, cord but then you had to cut the screws because they were not screws specifically it was like a you know I, I don't think spine surgery had to be uh, so aggressive so I waited until uh, mm -hmm. something came out like a good in implant and uh, by 2017 in, in Spain the global system mm -hmm. came out of CE Mark. CE Mark is like FDA, but in, in, in Europe. Okay. So I went to um, see Dr. Randy Betts and Dr. Antanachi in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to them for a week. Uh, I saw the cases, they were great. And then I went to the office, who I think is very important because that way you see the results. And I saw the patients so happy. And so I said, listen, this is the way to go. So I did the first case, and then from there I haven't stopped because, um, you know, a lot of thing, people who work with scoliosis around you are not surgeons, and I'm talking about physical therapies and mm -hmm. rehab, and they were telling me, what the hell you do to the patients that they are so flexible and they don't move? They, that doesn't happen with fusions. And then I start like, getting my data from my fusions back uh, and asking you know, with the, the SRS score, it's a questionnaire for how good, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was, I started calling patients and said, listen, what do you usually you do before we did the surgery? And he goes, well, I was a gymnastic, I was a swimmer, I was, you, did, you went back to uh, those sports? Yeah, but not competitive because I couldn't do it uh, as a competitive way. Not 100% of the patients, but, you know, 390% high. Mm -hmm. And then I asked them, are you happy with your fusion? And they say, yeah, I'm happy with my fusion. Oh, okay. But you couldn't go back to your normal sport life. Mm -hmm. so, so those things are the things that make me go to um, 
I call this non-fusion technique. Not I don't like to call ISC or BBT because really this is not between choosing ASC or BBT or choosing fusion. Is that we are in 2020 mm -hmm. and we need to improve the quality of life of the things we do to the patients. I think the things we're doing now, is, I hope in 10 years we are doing something different. You know, because I think we have to improve it. And I think we have to be more minimally invasive. And, you know, and then, I, you know, things that when you go to the OR and they put the patient to sleep, only relaxing the muscles, you correct 25% of the curve. So I always say, maybe we can put an injection in the muscle and correct it. So there have to be a way to give the patients a quality of life that they want. And then in orthopedics, as you know, we are trying to move all joints in the body. You have total hip replacement, knee replacements, shoulder replacements, uh, wrist replacement. And then in the spine, who have a lot of more movements, we fuse the patient. That doesn't make any sense. So we need to go and try to get better results. That does, I'm not criticizing the fusion, but you know we are in 220, so we need to improve that. And it's not, you know, uh, fusion is a good surgery. Yeah, it is. But are you comfortable doing this for all your, you know, for 100 more years? It doesn't make it. You know, they have to be better. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that that's the whole thing coming from Spain. That uh, NYU gave me the opportunity to do a lot of research. Um, and I think that's the way it goes, to try to improve what we have to give people quality of life. Because we, at the end, that's what these kids want. And what I wanted when I was 12 years old and they want to put me a brace. Yeah. The brace takes out my quality of life because I have to be with the brace 24 hours. And a fusion, always a good surgery and not, you know, doesn't give 100% of quality of life after the surgery. And that's a reality. We, we have to understand that reality and try to improve that. That means that tether is better than the fusion? No, it means that there is one more step into getting to a non-fusion technology. And that's the way I think about this. When I talk with, with uh, my colleagues about, you know, tethers and why the core brace and how can I improve that, why the FDA only approve immature? Why cannot we do immature patients? You mm -hmm. know, indications and stuff like that because uh, growth modulation is one thing in correcting the curve with the new technology and quality of life is, is something totally different. Yeah, so the, that's the thoughts I think. It's not, uh, I don't think um, it will be very sad that in 10 years we have another conversation and you tell me, that your son had a broken cord and they put another one because we don't have improved the technology. Mm -hmm. That will be sad, you know. Yeah. That's why we need to improve it. Well, I was talking to um, Dr. Sam Danny about that, and he was he was mentioning that he would be pretty furious if there wasn't um, some improvement in tethering technology within the next uh, two or three years. And he was also mentioning that there's often not a lot of um, investment made in uh, surgery for kids overall it's mo mostly adult oriented so even with mm. with tethering it's uh, a pretty um, rare technique that has been built up over time so it was, it's interesting no knowing the the behind the scenes a little bit um, you were very comfortable with anterior approach before and is that uh, is that why you chose to do more of, I know you don't like the distinguishing between the VBT and the ASC, but why do you like uh, the ASC better for more, for uh, greater corrections period? Yeah. So um, I did my fellowship here in NYU 20, 20 years ago. And the chairman of the spine surgery was Dr. Thomas Erico, who is in Miami now. Uh, and we did a lot of anterior thoracic fusions and it was very, very nice surgery, and, and he developed a technique of doing a mini, mini invasive open mini thoracotomy. And I remember we did a study against BB, uh, thoracoscopically mini open, and uh, the mini opens have the same results, of, almost, and then 
the pulmonary function test, who was our main concern, were the same. So, you know, from 20 years ago, I, I love the technology. The problem was that the rod usually breaks because they were thinner, and, and then the thoracic pedicle screw system came into town, and, you know, we have better correction, and so we changed from thoracic to, uh, to posteriorly. Uh -huh. And then um, when I went to see uh, Antonacci, I also saw, so, you know, I remember from my old days, um, thoracoscopically uh, fusions. And the problem with the thoracoscopically is that I think we can do much more maneuvers in the spine with a mini open because I can really rotate the spine more. I can get more compression. I can, I can get a much better result. Uh, maybe in a flexible curve, is almost the same, mm -hmm. but uh, that's one thing I would like to compare. How much rotation you can have in a flexible 55 degree curve, even though coronally are the same, but I, I, I rotate the spine and then I can put two screws easily with, uh, with a mini open. So my second screw helped me in my rotation and helped to put another core that decreased right now from 15 to 18% breakage to less than five. And you, you don't lose any flexibility. So the mini open thoracotomy give me more possibilities of fixing the spine than a thoracoscopic surgery. And because, you know, with the thoracoscope, you have the skin in the middle. You cannot move that, mm -hmm. those bolts too much. So that's why I think uh, mini opens are better than thoracoscopically because I can do more things in the spine than uh, the, than the thoracoscopic approach. Was, is the approach you're doing now the same approach as uh, Dr. Antonacci, or is it, is, have you modified a technique for your own uh, style? No, uh, the, the approach is the same. I do the same approach. Uh, I don't, well, I, the difference, like, uh, I think the only difference I see between me and him right now is that uh, I use my two screws to derotate because mm -hmm. I think I put the stronger force. And he uses some other technique with the disc, so it's very good. So, no, we, I think basically it's the same thing. You know, okay. they have a very good results. And uh, they have a lot of experience. They have a lot of cases and big mm -hmm. curves, and, and they're getting very, very good results. So, um. Just as a differential, so with Dr. Antonacci, um, where they are doing the, the single screws, you're doing a double screws, correct? And and because you're doing a double screws, you have more leverage, so you don't necessarily have to do as many, for instance, disc release on mature patients. Or is that how it works? No, I don't. I don't know that. I had to look at the data. No, no, I. I um... The the uh, decision to make these releases is based on your X-rays and your stiffness. Okay. So um, that doesn't change. Uh, if I and then thoracoplasty is the same thing. If you have more than 15 degree of scoliometer measurement, you do a thoracoplasty. If you correct if the bending films with fulcrum doesn't correct more than 50 percent, you know that curve is stiff, and then you have to release it. That doesn't change. Okay. Um, uh, the only thing is. My my thought, sorry, if you put, if you use two screws, force of two screws in the vertebral body, I think it's safer. But uh, I had to, we need to compare results. And okay. and it's very complicated to compare results because basically they get very good uh, corrections and I get good corrections. So we had to compare more rotation. So it's complicated to get comparing rotation only with the EOS X-rays. So one of the things I'm doing in NYU now is like, I like to order MRIs to all my, all my patients. Mm -hmm. I know 99% of the time they're gonna be normal. But uh, you know, if I get one who is a normal, that's enough. So uh, the good thing about the MRI also is that I'm doing in, in NYU a 3D reconstruction in the OR. So I really know how much I rotate the, the vertebral body individually in the uh, coronal plane cuts because I'm comparing the pre-MRI and the CT mm -hmm. that I do 3D, because I do a 3D spin in the OR. So mm -hmm. I, I only have two cases, but I hope I get a very good comparison of what I'm doing with that. 
And then we're going to try to do that also with the EOS. But all my pieces doesn't have EOS, so we need an EOS uh, X-ray to compare our rotation. Uh, Stephen Parent in Montreal are doing that. Uh, they're doing a lot of studies with uh, derotation and 3D to see how much really we correct the spine. Because at the end, the kids doesn't know they have 50, 60 degrees. They know they have a hump. And the hump is a rotation of the deformity. It's not mm -hmm. a coronal deformity. So if we can know how much we can correct and put the spine back into more normal rotation, I think that will increase the possibilities of uh, if the core breaks, don't go back to the old uh, degree of curve that they have before. With greater correction and rotation. Yeah. Uh, I guess there's a consensus. I've just been talking to other uh, surgeons about, of course, with idiopathic um, uh, adolescent scoliosis, variable factors. But once the scoliosis gets rolling, um, there seems to be a phenomenon phenomena called anterior vertebral overgrowth, which causes wedging from A to P, and that forces mm -hmm. the spine into hypokyphosis, then rotation, and then the scoliosis in the coronal curve. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that as well? As the current yeah, curve? I believe in that. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that's a concept that I believe. But I don't, I'm not sure. It's, when we talk about the growth modulation, and we talk about that anterior growth, um, and Talking about complications like overcorrection, uh, I have never seen, and I talked with Dr. Sandani about that, any overcorrection occurs more than 55 degrees. All the overcorrections are when you have more, less than 30, 40 degree curves, and you have a lot of growing left. Mm -hmm. So we need to study much better that uh, this end plate in the apex of the curve to find out how much really growth modulate the spine do. Um, and then, for example, I had two cases. I don't know if they're going to come to me and revive. I saw two patients that they had double curves, and they have a research zero, Sander one, and the lumbar one overgrowth, and now they have a big curve because it's overgrowth to the side of the other curve. And looking at those cases also, and uh, I think that, flexibility have another important part of that because when we do double curves, um, you, you see you have a 20 degree correction and then a 10 degrees, so a 10 different degree correction between the thoracic and the lumbar. Mm -hmm. it, and it's always because we can correct, it's more flexible the thoracolumbar curves than the thoracic. Mm -hmm. But maybe we have to learn to balance our corrections to a point that the core doesn't break because you have a lot of correction in one part and not that much in the other. So we need to learn about those things because basically, even this technique has been for 10 years, we're still learning from our, uh, our learning curves. So and looking at those cases, I go, you know what? They had a great correction post up, but there were more than between five to 10 degrees difference between thoracic and lumbar. Which one overgrowth? the one who was more corrected. Interesting. Yeah, and so now you, I have to, we have to go and change it. Uh, so so those, those are the, we learn from complications. That's reality. Okay. Now, when, with the overgrowth, when the curve goes into rotation and you're having bone modulation in a rotated state, that's completely messing up or that's also creating bone modulation at different stress points. Uh, correct. Right now, yeah. have you, have you noticed that when you, you derotate and, and you correct as much as you can in the coronal plane, have you noticed any bone uh, modulation over time after the tethering in the AP axis? So in my cases, I have a follow up, Two more two years. Uh, I have not noticed that that much because my main average curve size is almost 70, 70, 68 degrees, 70 degree curves. Wow. Uh, yeah, but that's what I was getting in Spain. And so, hmm. this, so uh, I think we need to see that in five years. Okay. Um, because I, 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 I really believe. Um, Dr. Antonacci, Dr. Betts' theory, Dr. Curie, about um, 
a brace theory that you take, you put a brace in your teeth and then you take it out and and the piece doesn't go back to where where what before, but they stay like in a middle part that is normal. Mm -hmm. So if we can modulate the bone and the muscles to to go back to the arena curve. Uh, the only way to find out if we're doing that is to follow five to ten years follow up. So the idea from from that point of view is that you have a original curve, you correct as much as you can, even if the tether breaks, you have enough stability with with muscle training uh, or and uh, muscle memory in a new position, and hopefully with some uh, bone remodeling as well. This is for for um, mature curves, right? Is that the rationale? Yeah, so much, yeah that's the rationale. And yeah. then um, one of the things I find out when I realize I, some cases of, from other surgeons and my cases of broken cord, that the first thing I see when they break is the rotation. They, they rotate. Hmm. Uh, so that's the dominant you already, force. Yeah, because that's the dominant force, I think, in the three-dimensional thing. And uh, I got patients that I saw the core break, but then I do pictures of their back. And then I'm looking at the pictures very closely, the hump increases. And then the parents always tell you, I think she increased the hump. And you say, no, 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 it's the same. But you look at them and he goes, yeah, it was. So that core was not working uh, at that point. And then it, when I saw that radiologically, mm -hmm. it was when it really went apart and, and the curve increased. But well, that sign of the rotation, I think, is one of the first things that the clinically you see when, when, um, when the core is not starting to to work, and I think that's the big difference between thoracoscopically and and, and uh, mini open that um, we correct that uh, force of the rotation. So, and I think it's one of the more important parts. Okay. Uh, A question I have for you is that in my mind, I'm visualizing. Um, the spine is a spring, and because of the vertebral overgrowth, it goes into hyperkyphosis, then it has to, to uh, reduce tension by going into rotation, and then mm -hmm. the, the coronal curve. But if you're bringing everything back to the center, are you kind of reloading the spine? Because Not the really. Get away from there? So one other thing is that I think the, the rotation is first and hypocarposis come after because oh. you do the MRIs and x-rays and you use uh, Dr. Peter Newton from San Diego who was one of the pioneers from uh, uh, BVT surgery and he had the two, the three more important papers right now uh, out there. Um, from, from his studies, he did a study about how we, you can see how much hypocarposis you have and you need an MRI and you need x-rays because rotation doesn't let you really see how much kyphosis you have. So you correct rotation, you correct kyphosis also. So uh, it's a combination of, 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 of all of them. Right. And, but, you know, a lot of people are starting in Canada is one of the places uh, who are really doing a lot of work in, 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 that, uh, in that field. Um, in the rotation you know, aspect. Which you can, yeah. Mm. And it's, I guess it's possible that depending on, possibly depending on where the vertebral overgrowth is, you know, if it's more lateral to midline, then it would force it into rotation a lot faster as well, as opposed to right back into hypokyphosis. Exactly. But even when we do, like I did a fusion on Monday, mm -hmm. I still, you know, helping a fusion. Our money over is starting to derotate this point. Because putting the rods in the screws, we correct the coronal plane. Mm -hmm. And then given the rod, the uh, size of profile that we need, we, we give kyphosis. But the whole maneuver is try to derotate the spine to bring the concave side up and the convex side down. And all the systems posterior fusion is to get that, mm -hmm. to get that rotation, to get that rotation. So if the fusion, the more important maneuver is to get that rotation down, we need to do the same thing in the anterior because we need to improve that too. Which makes complete sense because I've seen some of the levers they use in fusion just to, just to yeah. try and derotate, right? 
Well, you, you see those videos of all the companies. And the more important part is when you see those big things and they try to derotate it down. Yeah. Every one company have a different one, but our main concern is when we do these cases for infusion is derotate the spine. So and do you in, notice, infusion, we, yeah, we need to do it in the interior. And you notice that when you derotate the spine in fusion that it automatically goes into kyphosis as well? Yeah, because... Let me explain to you. So this is my finger. This is the kyphosis, okay? Mm -hmm. In the rock, it's like that. But my spine is down here because it's rotated. So I try to push that spine go up and get it to my rod so I can get my kyphosis back. Mm -hmm. So the whole maneuver, maneuver to get my spine to the rod is rotating the spine. So the concave side who is down is up and the convex side who is up is down. The convex side is what the hump is. The concave side is what the rotation was. So we, I want to put it up. So that's the whole point in the fusion. Try to bring your spine into the rod who is sagittally normal kyphosis. So if I can bring that spine to my rod, the only way I do that is rotating the spine up. Right. And I was talking to Dr. Betts as well, and he says that you have to do uh, the disc release in order to make space in the anterior column so you can do that maneuver. Yeah. Otherwise, there's not physically enough space. Is that correct? Yeah. The, well, disc releases help you for two things. If, you, um, if you're shortening the anterior column, you're going to get kyphosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. but then but that's normal. You you shorten the anterior part, it's gonna go like that because uh -huh. it's like this. So if I short, it's gonna. So we taking out the disc, we give a disc kyphosis. But then if I want to rotate, I need to release it and take the disc because the disc is holding me holding the rotation. And the apex of where the discs are, the if you see them, they are triangular. So you, we really need to open that to parallel the both air plates, and the only way to do that is with the disc release. Well, it's very criticized in, in the medical world, society, because, because uh, in, in the adult population, when they always have these problems when we take this, when you have an herniated disc. But I think the thoracic spine disc doesn't work the same as the lumbar spine, and we know that. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the other thing is we don't do anything with the end plates. It's only take the nucleus out and cut the anterior ligament so we can give it more releases. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, we don't try to produce a fusion. Uh, we try to release to get a better correction. You'll do multiple disc releases uh, along the apex. When you do the disc release, is it from the lateral aspect of the vertebra or is it from anterior? Well, I guess you cut the ALL anteriorly, but the disc release is from the front too? Yeah, so, see, yeah, yeah. So um, I put, I put there, you know, we have a technique in the adult called, when we do this in the lumbar spine, mm -hmm. with a retractor that goes all the way, this is the disc and the retractor goes all the way here. Okay. All the way to down here. So it protects me a lot. So I can cut the ligament because I'm seeing them. I'm seeing the whole this almost okay. to the posterior part. Mm -hmm. So I really cut it from anteriorly to posteriorly. So I release that. And I have a protection with my retractor that is made for that. So yeah, you have to cut it and you see it. You you can see it. This is on the so side of the that, Yeah, so basically you side. see this you see the the um, right side of your disc, mm -hmm. and then you see the uh, anterior part all the way almost to the end of the left side of the disc. You don't see the left side. In your right side, you're going to the right side, mm -hmm. and you don't see the right side when you're going to the left side, but you almost see the whole, the whole anterior ligament to cut it. Okay. So it's quite exposed and mm -hmm. easy to get to. Yeah, it's quite exposed, yeah. As you go further from the apex of the curve and you're still doing disc releases, do you also um, uh, cut the annulus and you remove the nucleus or it depends on how restricted they are? So in my experience, I, in my cases, I don't think I do, I haven't done more than 
three or four distributions, only the apex part. Okay. I don't touch the bottom below. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't done any disc releases. I don't do any disc releases in tobacco lumbar, in the lumbar spine. We don't, I don't touch those. Uh, okay. For two reasons, because I know from my adult, I do adult patient surgery, mm -hmm. that those discs, we, cannot, we don't need to touch them. And second, my flexibility in the tobacco lumbar spine is pretty big, so I don't need to do those releases to get a good, at least 50% correction. What percentage of your practice is uh, pediatric and what percent is adult? Well, since I started doing tethers, it, uh, it's funny because it, I, I was doing like 60 40, 60% mm -hmm. kids and 40% adults, and now I'm doing 80% pediatrics and 20% adults. And here in New York, uh, basically, I got three offices, and one is basically adults, but surgically wise, uh, I think it's going to be like 95.5 or 90.10, something like that, pediatric adults. Okay. Uh, and I want to build the early onset, so I need to do more kids with neuromuscular scoliosis and syndromic, and mm -hmm. yeah, so. That's great. That's, you, you sound yeah. so busy at three uh, offices. Uh, well, I want to be busier. I need to be busier. But, you know, I, I was lucky because I got a lot of patients following from Europe and they know, you know, with the uh, with this uh, Facebook and all this uh, Instagram and stuff like that. So patients all over the world, they can talk with everybody. So when I came to New York, my patients from international talk with the American patients saying, well, it's already good since going to New York. So right. um, they knew I was coming. And so um, it was a great opportunity. And then I took all my, you know, one of the things I told NYU is that I, to improve our academic uh, you know, studies and research, we need to get all the insurance possible so I can get more patients. So uh, that was one of my, my concerns. Right, because I I know I was gonna lose a lot of my international patients because private uh, is more expensive here than Barcelona. But if I can get uh, all the insurances, I can get enough patients, mm -hmm. uh, so I can do more surgeries. Well, since we're on this topic, there has been um, some indication that you might uh, periodically go back to Spain. Is that still in your plans? So, well, this is this pandemic changed everything. So. Yeah. Um, I was supposed to go back in July, the next month, to do like 15 cases. Um, because there were patients I already saw and they couldn't pay the amount of money in NYU. But, uh, you know, the pandemic changed the world. And uh, right now I cannot go back to Spain until 221. Mm. And uh, so there are patients that need the surgery because the curves can get bigger and it doesn't make any sense to wait for me if I can go back to Spain. Mm -hmm. When there are people like uh, Dr. Trovich in Germany or Dr. Al and I in Turkey who are very good surgeons with good experience that they can fix those patients and uh, um, money-wise it's almost the same as what I was getting there. And there are some that want to wait, uh, you know, but right now it's very complicated I come back and the reality is the more busy I get here and my family is coming and the only reason my wife uh, wanted to go back to Spain was my mother-in-law and she died because of COVID-19 oh, in May. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, the possibilities of going back uh, right now, I tell the patients, I, I really don't know if I'm coming. Right. So, to be honest. Yeah, because... It, I would love to come back. Uh, there's one patient I need to operate for sure. Uh, it's a five-year-old kid who have a 140 degree curve, and uh, he's a syndrome. And he, the mother didn't want to put a halo traction. He want to put throwing rods. He, so I really experimented with him because the mother said, "Listen, put the cord." I said, Listen, "The good thing about the cord is we can correct it to put in the curve. Let's see what how how he do this two years, mm -hmm. and then." The idea is to get him to 10, 11, 12 years old and do a fusion because the curve was too big. But uh, so I got him to 50 something. The patient is doing fantastic, and but I'm the only one capable of 
changing the core because you need a core change now. Uh, it's going to be two years and a half. And I had to go back and do it. it. They cannot come here, and I had to go. So, And I promised that family that I was going to take care of him. So, How old was the tether put in? Five years. Wow. Five. It, that must be the youngest, do you think? Uh, I, I don't know if Antonacci had done five, six years old. But uh, yeah, for me, it was my the younger one. But this was, a, you know, a, a, the typical case that, uh, like, you know, with idiopathic scolies, adolescent, you have choices between infusion. It's a good surgery. They have good results. For five years old, all the technology out there for him, the complication was so high okay. that the choices for him were not that big. You know, they, he didn't have... If you put a growing rod in a 140 degree curve, you know, the growing rods were coming out of the skin because he was so skinny. So mm. we choose this so we can get to a curve degree that we can do some growing technology, not the, the tether. So we, we got that at least two years and a half. So I'm happy with that. Sure. So the purpose of the surgery was done. He was in the hospital for eight days. Uh, he hadn't had any uh, upper respiratory infections in two years, and he's been having, he still have a big curve because he's almost in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But now if somebody wants to put a growing rod on him, they can. Mm -hmm. two, years and a, two years and a half ago. It's possible now. Yeah, now it's possible. Right. Yeah. yeah. Great story. Yeah. A couple of the questions for you. Do you... Um... Are you using mainly um, uh, Zimmer instrumentation at this point, or? Oh, so that's a good question. I, I'm, I think I'm the only one using both right now. So I'm using Globus for one curves, and you're using Zimmer for two curves. Um, why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I can use both systems. So for me, it's good because I can use both. And then my idea is like in six months time, uh, look at the data and find out which system I think is better. Okay. Uh, so, because at the end, it's not the same. You use one system and compared to other guy who's using another system. When the same surgeon used both systems, uh, first, I can change both systems and tell them, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Mm -hmm. I know the good things about one. I know the good things about the other one, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Tell you the truth, uh, what we want is that all the companies have a system because that make the prices go down mm -hmm. and also make the competition make you better. Yes. So that's the reality. More I know technology. they don't like that. <laughs> exactly. They, they, they don't want me to say that, but that's the reality. The more uh, you know, companies out there have their own tether systems, the only way to survive is being better than the competition. So for the patients, it's good, you know, because we're getting better. So do you see by any, using both now. Do you see any um, advancements on the horizon with respect to tether technology? Are you aware of anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I cannot tell you because I'm getting consult. You know, I'm working okay. in patents and consul in consultation for things. But it's very, you know, it's very easy. So. When people criticize this technology, the first thing they say, the core breaks. Mm -hmm. Let's get a better core. Absolutely. Okay. So, so the only thing you have to do is try to look for biomaterials that are one, they're flexible, and two, they're compatible with the human body. Mm -hmm. You know how many they are out there? <laughs> oh, you don't know. That many. Yeah. So what we have to do is Try to incorporate that into a compression distraction system that works. That's the whole idea of the thing. And then other things that company have to understand is that some surgeons are going to do it thoracoscopically and some surgeons are going to do mini open. Mm -hmm. They have to be a system for both. I was going to ask make you about it easy that. For, yeah, for both. Because uh, if you only have thoracoscopic uh, system is I need more things than a, to in my case is that thoracoscopic uh, uh, system to do the correction. So we, you know, with the companies I'm 
they talking to me and I think with all the surgeons around the world, uh, they're asking how can they get better? And mm-hmm. the only way to do that is try to uh, compare all the systems and try to improve them and look for better cord so it doesn't break mm-hmm. and ways to be more safer. That's why I'm doing 3D reconstructions and I did a navigation in my second case. So, you know, navigation is like you have your picture of the 3D reconstruction of the spine and you're putting your screw. It's safer than that. You're not going to get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, those things help you out. And I uh, would like to incorporate a robot. We're thinking the ways to incorporate uh, robotic surgery into this kind of cases because that will be like the mainstream mm. in, in not, all, not in corrections, but if we get a better screw purchase, I can do more things in my spine, you know. So one of the things we are, we're looking at is like our top screws in every construct is only to anchor it mm-hmm. because we cannot do a lot of forces because, you know, they've been coming out and pulling out. But uh, I think if we can create a great purchase with a better screw and a better angle with a robotic, maybe that help us out. Those That's are the things I'm looking at saying. Yeah, because yeah. I didn't know there were that many issues with s- screws failing right. with purchase. Uh, the top ones, the top ones okay. are, are the ones who are complicated because uh, the angle is different. Mm-hmm. And the anatomy is more complicated because the asicus vein right in that T4, T5 side. And uh, those ones, you even with the mini open approach, you have to do a, a thoracoscopic portal to put the screw. Right in those in the up ones and those are the ones that that we are afraid to pull because they are smaller in size right like like you compare a, a lumbar is a 35 40 40 something millimeter long mm-hmm. and that a t5 you put a 22 5 25 so okay. it's smaller so but remember that's our first anchor point mm-hmm. so we're pulling from that one i so, understand so so that force had to be you know, that screw had to be perfectly uh, put. So, and that's the one that if you put too, too uh, long, the aura is closed. Mm-hmm. So, so red flags around that one. Yeah. Are there any plans to go up higher than T4 with for higher thoracic curves? Or is it just... Yeah, so, so the, the only reason we don't go is anatomy-wise. If we can, you know, the UP... But that's one thing I talk with the thoracic surgeons, how, how comfortable they are dissecting vessels up so we can go to uh, T3, T2, T1. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I have done T4, T5. Right. Uh, so, but, uh, so we have to check that out. But that's, the thing is that the reason upper thoracic curves are very not or as, as few as when you do a thoracic bridge. So out of 100, 99%, 90-something percent, they are thoracic. You don't have to go high anteriorly. So, and one of the reasons we, like the fusion I did the other day, we went to 3-3, 3 because to get, to not get complications in the upper part with PJK and PJF. Okay. But if you go anteriorly, you don't need to go too high because you avoid those avoid those uh, complications of failure. So you did a bit of a hybrid where you fuse the top and you tethered the remainder. That, I haven't done it, but that's an option. Uh, I, I gave that option to a patient, mm-hmm. but at the end he didn't have the surgery, but that, that's in Turkey. They have done that. Okay. Uh, I think in the United States had, they had done hybrids um, fusing the thoracic one and putting tethers in the thoracolumbar curves. Okay. I know surgeons had, Tell me about it. I don't, I don't know anybody who has done it. I've seen pictures of people from Turkey who have done those hybrids. Not the Sorel and I, though. Another surgeon, I don't remember his name. Uh, in a meeting, he showed some cases of hybrids. Because mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning, he thought, well, thoracic fusions are good, really lumbar. Well, why, if I got thoracolumbar curse in thoracic, why don't fuse the one above and then we do thoracolumbar below? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I want movement down, I don't need movement up. Um, so they have done it. I have not done it, but the people have done that. Okay. Can I ask you a question about uh, mo- modern, uh, not modern, uh, mature tethers? Um, 
going back to originally when you're saying that it's with Dr. Antonacci and Dr. Betts indicating that, you know, you get as much correction as possible with the tethering and the disc release and the AL resection. And even if the tether breaks, you're hoping for muscle memory and muscle development and some modeling, bone modeling, remodeling. Yeah. Um, how long, do you have any data on how long the tethers will hold in mature spines? And I also want to know up to what age you tether or it just depends on the, 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 uh, the degeneration levels of the vertebra. Yeah, so it depends on the disc degeneration basically. But, um, and I'm, I'm thinking of doing some hybrids in the, the other population. So, because when, like I saw, I got, I saw this last month, I saw two patients who have uh, seen a surgeon who recommended P10 to sacrum. That's a big surgery, mm -hmm. a fusion. Um, they were not as, as degenerated as the apex part. So, you know, my thoughts are uh, a lot of uh, complications when we do thoracic uh, those kind of surgery is because when we stop at T10, we always have problems in failure above the T10 fusion. But if you go anteriorly and you leave movement above and below and stop at four and lift the five, one, and four, five, this three of movement, maybe you don't need a fusion all the way from T10 to uh, sacrum. But the apex of those adult patients are already fused. This is bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, if you, if you put an example, you had T10 to L4, the L1, 2, 2, 3, and T12, L1, they are already bad disc. Mm -hmm. But if you fuse that part and you leave movement above and below the fusion, uh, maybe we avoid a long fusion in the long run. Which would be preferred, 100%. Exactly, but we don't know that because we have not, this is in the medical world, you do that. There's a lot of criticism right now with this, but um, I know Dr. Antonacci have done adults, and I have done adults, and my adults are doing very well in a more than year follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm following them very closely because they, they have pain and the scoliosis, mm -hmm. and their pain is gone. I don't get great corrections like I do when they are flexible, mm -hmm. but they are more balanced and they can get at least 50% of the correction. And the size of profile is much better. So that's a thing we need to study. We, you know, we need to get our, our eyes open and think a lot of things that are happening in the adult population when we fuse and see our complications and see if this technology will help us in that complications. Uh, that's the way I see things. Well, it just seems that it's the natural progression going to the adult population with tethering and hopefully with, um, with advancements in the tether and yeah, well, technology. yeah, band technology. Yeah, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Because lately, uh, you know, the way we fix uh, adult deformity, we put more screws and more rods. And so they have to be, the point that we had to stop putting things into the body and trying mm -hmm. to find why we are having those complications. How can we fix it without putting so much materials in the body? That's what we need to understand that. I if I need to fuse a patient and, and go to T10 and we aren't worried that at the end they had to go all the way to T4, something is wrong. Something we had to do. And so we are mm -hmm. doing tethers in the posterior, not a tether cord, but but we try to protect the upper fusion levels with something that makes movement so it doesn't fail. So everybody is thinking about leaving movement above and below a fusion. So mm -hmm. uh, that's one, how can we do that? Right. Yeah. So you are doing uh, posterior tethers right now as well or? No. Okay. No. Because I know but there are people that are doing it. I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know the data about that, but there are people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, question I have for you is um, just regarding my son. I have to ask you because I'm thinking that I was hoping that um, with because he has a very severe hyperkyphosis and very little thoracic, uh, thoracic flexion, 
Um, and that's impacting his neck, which has pretty significant reversal right now. Mm -hmm. And I kind of second guess myself in terms of it would probably have been better for him to have some disc release in order to get that kyphotic curve. But I was wondering, I'm always concerned about disc release for growing kids, right? Yeah. Is that a concern for you? So the first thing you have to think is you did a good decision. Forget about the past and think about the future. Right. So we don't know that data. Okay. The data will be out in 10 years. So um, I think that these releases are going to help with cyber profile and at the end it's going to be better. I, I think so. Mm -hmm. But you, you, I've had that data to give it to you. I don't have that. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I have my cases compared to uh, BBTs and I know Antonacci's cases compared to his first cases a bit and it's a big difference. So we have to wait to see what happened in 10 years. Yes. Yeah, because right now I can tell you, oh, I, they look great, but it's only two years follow up. Mm -hmm. Let's wait to see what happened in five and 10 years. And if the things go the way we want it, it's going to be a big, big change in surgery wise. Absolutely. And those, all the, yeah. So, but uh, only time will let us know. And right now, I, I, I think. You uh, did a good decision. You went to a great center. You went to a great doctor. And, uh, you know, the future will let us know. So. Truer words or have never been said. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. But, uh, the, 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 you know, all these things, the, the future will let us know. Um, and the data will, the day I see that uh, Tetris doesn't work, I don't want to use it anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to be fighting uh, the results. But uh, right now, I'm very happy with how my patients are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you ask me if I get, I, I get better correction with a fusion, no. Basically, they're flexible, I can get, but when they are not, I need to do this with this. I don't get a, the same correction as the fusion. But quality of life, oh, they're much better. Mm -hmm. They're happier. They're much happier. Yes, and you know I've been doing fusion for many years, so it's, I can uh, I see that. And then it's not only me. You you ask uh, the therapists and the uh, chiropractors, and all of them tell you the same thing. Oh, what a big change between one another. And then the studies from China is with flexible uh, doing flexible studies, they are better. So, mm -hmm. I'm and then uh, last year in Montreal, Stan Farrant show a. Uh, a nice study about uh, quality of life questionnaires between thoracic fusion versus tethers, and they were more better in the tethers population. Yeah. Quality of life questionnaire. Thoracic cases, not thoracolumbar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Let's wait. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Oliveri, thank you so much for your time. It was a great interview. I learned a ton, as usual, every time I talk to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great interviewing. and. Uh, I hope uh, everything goes well in Canada and uh, everything stops the pandemic and we go back to normal. And uh, Me too. when you go, when you do follow up with your son, stop in New York and say hello. I will. <laughs> we'll catch up. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much for the invitation. Okay. Bye. Bye. So the first case is a 13-year-old girl, pre-menarche. We have, we have uh, research zero, Sanders two. We got an 82-degree curve, a thoracic with a compensatory 28-degree curve. This is an interesting case because for the FDA approval indication, she is approval because of GSR, you know, research zero and Sanders two. Be, but the curve size is not an indicator because the FDA says 65 degrees. That's one of the things that I think we have to change because I think it's about flexibility. So when I did the bending that you don't have the x-rays, uh, the 82 degree went all the way to 20. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty flexible curve. And so we did the case, it's gonna be two years now. And we did, uh, 
only the thoracic, and we corrected uh, all to 12 degrees. And later, in the late follow-up uh, from two years, she continued to have the same degrees, uh, no broken cord so far. Um, if I can ask you a couple of questions. Yes. So you did a double tether at the apex. Is that kind of common for the severity of her for you? So what I did was I, you know, I did double screws all the way from, let me, uh, this is two, three, two, one, 12, 11, 10, nine, eight. So from eight down, I double cord, double screws. And then the top ones are single because that part I don't, I don't do any kind of um, pulling or compressing because they can come out. Mm -hmm. And the uh, lateral x-rays, well, I think it's very important in this case, it shows nice kyphosis and lordosis compared to what she had before. And even her neck kyphosis is better post-op and two years and what she had before surgery. So that's one of the other things that this type of surgery improve your sagittal profile better than your, uh... yeah. So this is a typical case to show that, you know, you put a core is flexible, indication for the core is flexible curves. If you need flexible curves, you get good corrections. And that's why you feel that the parameters should be expanded post uh, 65 degrees if there's flexibility. Exactly. I think flexibility is the whole thing. And, and you realize that you have a cord, it's flexible, you need a flexible spine to put a flexible cord. Okay. So this was immature spine, so you did not have to um, do any disc release for this particular person as well? No. So my idea is that because I, we don't really know how much growing, mm -hmm. and we don't know anything about growing yet. I don't touch the disc when you are still growing. Uh, I leave everything to the growth. And um, so, uh, and I think derotating the spine with the, the mini open uh, improves your sagittal profile better than taking the disc. So I don't like to take this out when they are still growing. Okay. And with the mature is different because I want to be more flexible. So I do disc releases. When I don't do disc releases, any mature uh, growing spine. So if I want to do growth modulation, I don't. I don't touch the disc. Okay. Now, what happens if um, you have the same identical case, but uh, it was a much stiffer spine? For with 82 degree curve? Yes. No, you know, my experience is that um, if I had to do a lot of things, so I'm not growth modulating anymore. So if they have an 82 degree curve immature patient, though it's very stiff, I tell the patients I need, I don't gonna growth modulate, is I'm gonna get a correcting whatever I get, but I'm not doing growth modulation. So they have to understand that because everybody thinks that you put the core and when you grow, you're gonna get better mm -hmm. correcting. But that is when you have a lot of growing left and your curve is flexible. But uh, if you have growing left and your curve is not flexible, you need to make the curve flexible. So you take these releases and I think doing these releases, you stop the growth modulation. So it's not a growth modulation technique anymore. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, would you tend to delay uh, the tethering until the spine is a little bit more mature, or would you, or we, you know, you have to be concerned about the curve getting worse as well. So how do you yeah, kind of so decide? When you have this kind of uh, big curves, you don't have many choices. So you do want to do a fusion, or you want to do a or you wanna correct it and take these releases and cut rips and correct it. So okay. you don't have choices. If you have 35, 40 degree curve is small and you wanna let the patient grow a little bit more, um, is yeah, I do that. But in this kind of cases, it's already 82 degree. You don't have any choices. Okay. I guess we can move on to the second, uh, second case of the mature spine at 72 degrees. The 72 degrees, yeah, just he's 70 year old. Um, girl, she used to be a gymnastic. She almost a professional gymnastic, and uh, they offered her a fusion when she was uh, 13. Premenarche. She already had like a, a 58 degree thoracic curve, 
and a 40 degree uh, tracolumbacore. But she was afraid that she cannot continue to do uh, gymnastic. So she decided to tell her mother that she didn't want surgery. The mother was afraid also that she, she didn't want it. So uh, the curves started getting better, worse and she was not looking good. She had a hump of almost 20 degree a scoliometer measurement. So there was a point that she didn't have any choices. So when she found out about uh, the cord and the opportunity of flexibility, she came to my office. I explained to her that uh, the curves uh, were rigid and that we had to do these releases, but you know the quality of life is gonna be better. And I explained that we don't have the data of 10 year follow-up from mature patients, but uh, for the data that's coming out, it was good enough and this surgery doesn't close the door for a fusion. And she agreed, uh, we did the surgery with a nice balanced spine. Um, very good uh, cytoprofile profile correction. You check the uh, cervical spine, it's, uh, it's now kyphotic, not, uh, new, um, sorry, lordotic, not kyphotic compared to the pre post, uh, pre-op, sorry. And uh, she is now two and a half years. Uh, and I think uh, right now she continued to do the gymnastic, but not as a professional anymore. So, but she continued to work out and stuff. So he got, she got one more year of professional gymnastic after the surgery. Okay. How, sorry, how old was she when she had the surgery? 17. 17? Okay. Now you've done um, older spines as well, I've heard as well. What's the oldest uh, person that you've done um, ASC on? Uh, I don't only a few adults. I, I don't like, I think, let me look for the data. I've done only four out of my 75 cases. Okay. And all of them have pretty decent flexible spines and then um, the discs at the one MRI and the discs were, were also fine. They were not degenerate. The degenerate. So uh, out of the four, the, the three of them were 21, 22, and 24. So it's basically, it's like an adolescent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, and one of the cases, the only one is above 30 years. She's 31 years old. Um, so I consider the 20, 24, and 23 like, adult adolescent kind of thing is yeah because they really are mm -hmm. 31 is the really adult one that i did and uh, if you have back pain and you have a bad l5 was one disc but the four five this had like a 25 degree tilt so at the beginning when i saw her i was going to do the l5 as one anterior for zero fusion but then she started saying that the pain was in the hump, in the hump, in the hump. And then we did, we, I saw her like three or four times and we were gonna do a hybrid, do a 5-1 fusion and a core that uh, we went two levels, two cords at, from T5 to L4, T5-11 and 11-4, and left side, right side. And um, I saw, let's do this first and then we do the second part. And she's right now, today, six months post-op, no pain. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I had to follow her closely because I want to be sure because the L5 is one was bad, but um, I'm going to do an MRI next month to see if the changing the angle of the four five disc put less pressure at the five one. That's why she have less pain. Um, and we got a 52 degree percentage correction. So 52% uh, correction. So she was very happy with that. And right now she's six months. Let's see what happens. And I assume you had to, for her, you had to do, well, let's, going back to the case with the 72 degrees and the 17 year old, uh, you had to do disc releases for her as yeah, well. Yeah, so this is what I think. I think that this releases uh, in the apex the worst case scenario, they fuse, but you still have movement above and below. So and that's, the whole, uh, that's the whole discussion about this. It, it, this technology can be done in mature patients or not. 
when we see the data from the adult population, every level above a fusion, you usually have PJK and PJF. Uh, PJK is for uh, post-junctional kyphosis or failures because it's a fuse part and above is a movement part. Mm -hmm. So why don't we fix the apex part and leave movement above below the apex and maybe help in the future in those cases with adults? No, that's the data we have to find out. You know, but sure. um, people are putting tethers posteriorly above fusions to avoid that. Right. Well, let's do it anteriorly. Mm -hmm. I understand. Do you see any kind of um, future tethering available for um, older adults, 30, uh, 40, et cetera? Well, there are people that have done an adult population and they have good results. But you know, there's not just a lot of people, you can be 40 and looks like 60 and you can be 40 and look like 20. So it depends on, on the uh, MRI, how the discs are, how flexible the spine is, uh, how healthy the patient is to, you know. So all of these things, we're gonna start studying and we're gonna find, find the data in four or five years and then we realize what we're doing is right or wrong and we have to go back and, and start thinking of improving, you know. Okay. The more important thing is the patient know what they're getting into. So I, you know, I try to explain to the patient that the first option is always a fusion in an adult. And the second option is experimental because right now we don't have the data. Absolutely. Yeah, and they, transfer. They, have to, they have to understand that completely, you know. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Thanks. Talk to Anything you need, let me know. How's your son doing? He's doing good. We're doing more of the rehab, the Schroth, and he's getting into that a little bit more aggressively, and it does seem to be helping a little bit. I just he just has to grow another two or three uh, inches. That would be perfect. Yeah, that would be good. All right, take okay. care. Take care. Bye. Enjoy Bye. your rest of the day.